Here we are, back to Gary Paulson's Tuckett's Gold. We're going to end up doing chapter 8 and 9. They spent that night and the, full, the next full day working on the horses. It was one thing for Francis to say they'd ride, another to make certain they could. The ponies were in a slightly weakened condition at first, and perhaps that was for the best. The Pinto still managed to throw Francis twice. Lottie took a small white mare with a circle around one eye, and Billy took a muddy gray pony because he had said it reminded him of the mule, and he missed the mule. Where'd you get that old where'd you get that old mule anyway? Lottie asked. You never told us. Uh, two men named Courtweiler and Dubs came on me and stole everything I had and left me the mule. Well, Lottie turned to look at Francis. I'll bet you fixed those cricks. Uh, the mule helped, said Francis. But that's another story. Luckily, only the pinto bucked. The rest needed care. Francis used some of his deer grease to treat the and to treat the cleaned cuts and bruises so the flies wouldn't get into the wounds. And spent the rest of the day making usable jaws, jaw bridles and reins out of the braided picket lines and halters. They picked one other horse, a reddish mare, for a pack horse, though he, they had no true pack to put on her back. They tied the horses to the tree for the two nights. They were camped, and Francis slept at the base of the tree to be ready in case something frightened them. At dawn the next morning, Francis shook the other two awake. We're leaving. Come on. They ate cold cooked meat, and before true light, they headed out back in the direction from which they'd come for the rest of the gold. Francis led at first, riding the pinto and pulling the pack mare, with an eight-foot piece of picket line. They climbed out of the stream bed and onto the flat of the prairie. He and the Pinto had worked out their differences, and he found the small horse quick and responsive, answering to knee pressure so he could steer with his legs and keep his hands free. What about the two extra horses? Lottie following, followed Francis, and Billy brought up the rear on his gray. Enough is a feast, Francis said. We can't lead them all the time, so they're on their own, but I think they'll follow. And he was right. They fell in behind Billy and walked along as if led. Francis and the children found that the Spaniards' new burial site had not been bothered. They used Billy's sword. He could not let anyone else carry it to dig up the gold and silver. He, they put it on the pack mare, balancing it on the either side in the deerskin pouches. There was no cinch, and at first the packs would not stay on. Lottie figured out a way to tie it into the mane's mane to keep it centered. Francis took some of the, another piece of the braided rope that had held the ponies and looped it beneath the mare's belly to keep the packs tied down. It was not truly a cinch, but it kept the packs from flopping or falling, coming loose. They started north again late in the afternoon, and by the dark they were passing their camp of the previous night. As before, they began with Francis in the lead, but in time, he handed the pack mare over to Lottie and began to range, moving left and right for the center line of the center line of their march. It felt wonderful to be riding again. The Pinto was a good horse, and with a little grass and rest and water, uh, with a little grass and rest and water, would be a great one. They had meat left from the last kill, enough for two more days, and now they could cover 30 miles and more a day. At dark, Francis came back to the creek bed where some small cottonwood stood. They tied the horses to trees, each separately, and gathered the wood and cooked meat and ate until they were full. They had, a, had to dig a, a seep hole for water. The stream was dried up, but the water was sweet, and there was plenty for all three of them and the horses. Francis then made a circuit on foot with his rifle, moving out half a mile in the dark, and could not see any sign of light on the horizon or from their own fire. He had put on a good face for Lottie and Billy, but he was worried. If the ponies had come from the Comancheros, they would be tracking them. But there was no indication that anybody was coming, and so he went back to the fire just in time to hear Lottie finish what had apparently been a long story about horses she had known back home. Billy was sound asleep, and <laughs> Francis curled up near the tree by his pinto, his rifle in his arms. Soon all three were asleep and there was no sign, not a single indication, that on the following morning, Lottie would find the castle in the clouds. It was strange that Lottie was the one to see it first. She had just been telling about a book she, she, she'd heard or somebody had read that had men fighting with, huge, with swords, huge swords as tall as the men, and the men lived in castles. And when she looked up and said, look, that one over there, and sure enough, there was a castle, or something that looked so much like a castle, it didn't matter. It was far off on the horizons, a floating or floating above the horizon, with blue daylight showing beneath the castle and beneath the earth it stood on. It appeared to be made of red sandstone, which, with buildings on top made from the reddish earth and a tower at each end. Look close, she said. 
you can see the people. They had been riding close together, and at first Francis and Billy couldn't see what she meant. But when they moved their heads closer to Lottie's line of sight, and castle, the castle jumped into focus, and she was right. Francis could see small figures moving along the roof or the top of a wall, and around the wall at the base and off to the side was a field of what seemed to be corn, dried and golden. I bet it's Pueblo Indians of some kind. It's a mirage, Francis said. We've seen them before. Not like this one, Lottie said. Not a castle, and not this close. A mirage doesn't have to be far away. Mr. Grimes told me once he saw a mirage of a sailing ship on, a, on an ocean while he was washing his face in a stream. But the people, Lottie pointed, you can see them so clear. They rode in silence for a time, a strange state for Lottie, and Francis had to agree with her. Mirages usually didn't last long, and the, or they wavered in the light or shimmered and disappeared. This one did none of those things. Instead, the light beneath it narrowed and vanished until the structure was clearly connected to the ground, and then it started to grow as they rode through the day, higher and higher, until even Francis had acknowledged that it wasn't a mirage at all, but a real castle. Except that it, as they grew near, it became clear that it wasn't a castle so much as a small town on the top of a butte. And with that knowledge, Francis realized that he was leading two children and a pack horse, carrying a fortune in gold toward a strange village on a strange mountain filled with strange people who might not be friendly. When evening caught them, they were still a good 10 or 12 miles from the butte, and Francis dropped into a small gully filled with brush and salt cedar and tied the horses. We'll make a cold camp, no fire, no cooked meat, dig a sea pole for water. As soon as it's dark, I'm going to move a little closer and take a better look at that place. It's a castle, Billy said. Lottie was right. No, Billy, she said. It's a town on a mountain. I just thought it was a castle. Still, they'll have food and water and maybe candy we can buy with gold. With the gold, I think we ought to get up there and see if they've got a store. Francis smiled, though it was lost to the others in the gathering dark. They ate some small pieces of cooked, partly dried venison, and then Francis set them, settled them in and walked off into the dark. He set a good pace for two hours and covered about five or six miles. Then he slowed a bit and walked another four miles. In two more hours, he had been moving in a stream bed. Dozens cut the prairie's surface so he could so, and so could not see what was in front. But after walking what he thought might be ten miles, he pulled himself up to the edge of an arroyo and took a look. He was surprised to see that he was quite close to the, but the butte. The moon helped him to see the small adobe houses. They had a soft, curved beauty in the moonlight, and here and there he saw the light of a fire coming through an opening between two, two houses. There were no lanterns, nor did there appear to be fire from candles or anything like window. Uh, he didn't see a horse herd, but there were several fields of corn plant, plant, plants, dry and apparently harvested last fall, and his mouth watered at the thought of cornbread and gravy to go with a venison. A sound stopped his dream, a soft sound, close, something brushed, no, some sound he'd heard before, something sliding, really close, not sliding either, more slithering. The snake hit him just as he realized what it was and saw it in the moonlight. It didn't rattle, though it was a good four feet long and had close to, to a dozen rattles. Francis' head had been just over the edge, top edge of the roya, and his right arm his upper right arm lay along the dirt as he held himself there, and the snake hit the muscle on his right arm down from the shoulder about four inches. He had some good luck to go with bad, with a bad. He was wearing his buckskins, and so the fangs did not get in as deep as they might have, and the snake would, could have hit his neck instead of his arm, which would have killed him pretty quick. But the fangs did get through into his arm, and the snake dropped a heavy dose of venom. Ah! Francis fell back into the stream bed, six feet down, and for a few seconds, panic took him. Jumbled images and words, stupid, he thought. Grimes had told him once the Apaches didn't like to move at night because the snakes hunted them. He knew that. He should have been more careful. Stupid way to die. Couldn't cut up on his shoulder. Couldn't cut up on his shoulder or couldn't get it to suck it away. Too far back to Lottie and Billy. He'd never make it. The pain was immediate and intense. His whole shoulder was on fire. How long? Minutes. He'd heard some, somewhere that maybe half an hour was all it took, and the bite was high on his body. The poison would reach his brain soon or his heart. He could lie down and die right there, or he could just fight to live. To do that, he needed help. Somebody to cut the wounds, bleed it, poultice it, or suck it. Soon he had to get help. The village. 
His mind was fuzzing now. Everything became becoming blurred as the pain drove him into shock and the venom worked onto his system. He had to keep moving, make it to the town on the butte, keep his legs moving, not running, had to keep it even, keep his blood from pumping hard and carry the poison, but keep it moving. Colors now and flashes, he stopped for a moment and vomited. He thought how silly it was to waste all the venison he'd just eaten. His arm and shoulder were on fire and he kept seeing visions. Lottie and Billy in the wagon, Billy riding the mule backward, more colors, gold, gold bars and silver bars, and then a sun exploding in his brain, then going out and out, and he was falling now, first to his knees and almost down before somebody was there. A strange looking man in a strange costume, not a man, a demon, no, a wild beast with a mask with bulging eyes there in front of him, making sounds he couldn't understand. Help, Francis tried to speak to the monster, snake butt, shoulder. Two children, help! But all that came were more words he couldn't understand, and then he was sinking to the sandy floor of the arroyo, first to his knees, and then over on his face, and then there was nothing. Ah, that's the end of chapter nine. Well, that's it. And if you want to know how to take care of snake bites, sucking it out is not the way anymore. We now find out that's not the way. You'll have to research it and figure out how you actually take care of snake bites. But there you go. That's it for chapter eight and nine. Back with more later. Bye.